Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk, we talk movies. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us again this week at The Screenwriting Life. We love having you. And uh, as we continue to write everything out, we're bringing you the show remotely. Corona, Corona life. Um, Today, as we mentioned last week, we're going to talk to you about structure. And um, the reason we thought we needed to do this was, um, you know, everybody has different ideas of what structure is to them. And we just thought it was important that you guys know when Lori and I say the word structure, kind of what we mean and what that means in our brain. So um, just as a base, just to lay it down uh, for everyone. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, But first, we're going to do our section on how our week was. Lorian, how was your week? Well, I want to start by saying that uh, right now I'm experiencing some brownouts in my house. So if uh, the power goes out, then my internet goes out. So Meg, it'll be the Meg show today. (laughs) And I couldn't get my Zoom to work on my computer, so I'm doing it off my phone. And someone keeps texting me a million texts and interrupting the phone. So if you see me put my finger forward into your (laughs) face in the camera, that's because I'm trying to get rid of the text. So sorry, that's life. That is the roll with the punches. Yes. That is the kind of week you have, you know, that is life right now. Yes, especially right now. So my week, I, you know, I uh, I had a general on Zoom, which was interesting. Nice. Uh, uh, you know, and I love meetings. I love getting dressed for meetings and picking out what I'm going to wear and going there and getting there early because, you know, I always get nervous. I need to find parking and then meeting someone in person and reading the the vibe in the room. So like a Zoom general it was really hard for me, uh, you know, sort of making sure that I was picking up on who they were and they were picking up on who I was and making sure I wasn't shouting at my computer. You know, it's it's a whole it's a whole new skill set I have to learn. Um, and I have some more coming up. So um, it'll be fun. It is hard, right? Because you can't energetically, it's learning a new way to pick up energy. And are they interested? Are they not? Like, I'm thinking about pitching something and I'm really thinking about how do you do that? Uh, it's going to be, a, it'll be interesting to see how we adapt. Yes. We'll give you any, we'll give you any clues audience as we go forward. I think what I realize is I need to have the camera set farther back. So more of my body is in frame and not just my head because. Oh my so God. Much- so I should move it back. Is what not she right said. Right now. This I'm just saying really that like, because um, the, person I had the general with had it set so I could see from like her whole torso and so I was picking up on body language and posture and so I could read her a little better but I was just um sort of shoulders and up realizing oh I'm closing off a huge part of how I communicate so so just sort of sort of figuring that out um and then I uh I am working on this animated project so I got to do art review so I got to give notes which was awesome and then I had some working sessions on that project and then I got notes on another project. Uh, and so that was what it was. Um, notes, yeah, I got notes. Um, and then, um, you know, I've, I've been really, I've been struggling through my weeks, right? The Mondays start out good, Tuesday's okay. On Wednesday, I have like a full nope day. Like, nope, I'm not doing anything. I'm not cleaning the kitchen. I'm not homeschooling. And then Thursdays, generally I have this weird crash. And yesterday was really bad. And I was trying to uh, sort of dig into it and articulate what it is and sort of write down all my fears and name it. And it, it comes down to a lot of the stuff I feel as a writer every day, I think, like comparing myself to other people, I'm not measuring up, fear of connecting to the emotion of my character because then all of my emotion will come and gobble me up right behind it. But right now it feels so exacerbated and so much bigger. So yesterday was just a day of terrible negative self-talk. Oh no. Right. And so I did all the things I do. I reached out to people. I wrote a lot of real nonsense words. I don't even know what I was writing. It doesn't matter. But, you wrote. Yeah. That's what's important. Yeah. So it's, I, this is really hard for people. You know, I have anxiety and depression. I have some PTSD around health stuff that happens in my family. So this is particularly scary as I'm sure a lot of people are experiencing. And it just, it's making it hard to see through, am I doing enough? Am I doing not enough? Is the work I'm doing good enough? You know, and is this an excuse? Is this just like, I'm okay enough as I am existing, surviving? So it's 
for me as a writer, I always kind of live in that space, you know, the, the right. sort of emotional turmoil of it. So this is challenging me in a lot of mental health ways. So I am, you know, leaning on all my tools, but it's still really hard as I'm sure it's a lot, it's hard. We're so isolated. Yeah, it, it is. It, it's hard normally just to be a writer and any kind of artist. Um, and now like it is all exacerbated and I'm trying to see it as an opportunity to hone some skills in terms of all that stuff being up so big right now, just the skill of, and by the way, I don't have it. I'm trying to get it. Um, <laughs> okay, which voice am I listening to right now, right? And how do I turn down the volume on the negative voice and hear the bigger, older, wiser, you know, beyond your ego voice that is as old as the universe that knows that you're valuable, that knows that no matter what you write today or what notes you get or don't get, your value is not actually attached to that. That is a completely separate thing outside of you. It's very hard to attach to that voice. And sometimes the only way I can get there is by writing because somehow getting into your character and your storytelling, I think that is a more ancient, uh, beautiful, creative part of the universe. So it's, that's where I'm going. Um, but I'm also then going to eat a donut. So either way. <laughs> so many donuts, so many chips. I, I mean, you know, I, I trust me, I've got my uh, issues uh, in terms of where we all hide. But um, sugar is my favorite go-to, um, especially with bread. But um, I hear you. Uh, I, I wanted to share two phrases I heard this week that I thought were so great. Um, one was, um, I heard that... Um, if you know when things or or people are in your life and they are challenging you, um, this psychiatrist said it was a it was like a, a podcasty kind of thing, and he said um, he thinks of it as a tormentor. To think of it tormentor to break up that word and to hear the word mentor in it, that these challenging things are coming to mentor you, and that your tormentor is actually mentoring it is bringing a life lesson it's bringing something that can help you evolve and I thought that was such a great word and the other one I was talking to a great writer his name is Justin Marks and um, I had a zoom with him and he mentioned that when he was working as a writer with John Favreau they were at a point um, in the writing process where John Favreau said dude you just have to go and hug the cactus and I was like Oh my God, that is so amazing that at every point in the writing process, you just sometimes have to go hug the cactus and you're going to get all the needles in your arms and it, it is just going to happen. And I mean, think about it, you guys, that's like John Favreau, like one of the you know most accomplished, talented people. And he still sees it as hugging a cactus. You know, it's not about ability. It's not about talent. It's about process. This is the process. Because we are doing the big, deep work, the cathartic artist work is hugging a cactus. I just love that phrase. So um, I think that applies to so much in life. Sometimes you just got to hug the cactus. Um, I feel like her, both those things, the tormentor and hugging the cactus, are both so inspiring and deeply, deeply terrifying and upsetting. <laughs> oh, like, no, they're supposed <laughs> to only be inspiring. No, but but, but it, because it's so challenging, right? Because it's like, oh, I'm, but like... The intellectual idea of doing it sounds great. Yes, I love that. Emotionally, the idea is like core terrifying, right? Like I know, but because you have to get through to the other side. Yes. When you get through to the other side and you've hugged the cactus, you go, oh, it wasn't that bad. It's like being so afraid for the shot. And then you're like, oh my God, the shot wasn't even that bad. But you spend so much energy avoiding the shot, right? I mean, I, I, my husband teases me all the time because do not talk to me on the way to the airport because my anxiety is so high getting out of that plane. And as soon as I'm on the plane and they shut the door, I'm like, oh, well, okay, we're done. We're in. There's nothing you can do about it. And my anxiety completely goes away. Meaning what sometimes the thing that you are amping up about is actually stopping the writing and you get into a loop. And yeah. so you just have to jump off the cliff. And the more you jump off every day, the easier that jump gets and you start to realize it's not far. And okay, there are days that it's far. I'm not going to lie. There's days that you're like, oh my God, this cliff. I'm just going down and down in the writing. But that's 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 the process. So I, I, I hope you guys just don't feel alone 
Um, I, I hear that it's emotional and hard, but you know, you're not alone. Um, from the top to the bottom of experience, uh, everybody is in the same boat. Um, on my projects this week, I got notes and I realized, oh, I really something really important about myself in terms of the tour mentor part of it. Um, I they were really good notes, by the way. It wasn't the quality of the notes and the ideas. I just realized that emotionally I need time. Number one, as I'm waiting for the person to read, I my brain kind of fractures and it's very hard for me to write because some part of my brain is unconsciously working on, do they like it? What Are they going to blow it up? If they blow it up, what are we going to do? Like how much time do we, like I just start to, some part of my brain is moving and spinning. And then once the notes come in, and again, these were perfectly fine notes, smart notes. Um, if anything, I was like, oh, I should have thought of that. Um, I still need a day before I start writing just to let it soak in. And sometimes I don't have that time because I might be on a, do, on, on a deadline, but it was good to know that about myself, right? And not judge myself that that's how my brain processes notes and getting feedback, but I need a little bit of space up front and on the back end. And that's just what I'm going to have to schedule in because that's how my, that's how my brain processes. And then I fi feel fine as soon as I start writing. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm dealing with it now. I'm, I'm starting to deal with it and it always gets better. Um, so meaning the notes, whether you like them or not, they challenge you to make it better. Right. Um, and the last thing I'd say about my week that I wanted to share with you guys was um, I'm really trying to carve out space for my passion project, which, and I realized um, it helps to have a deadline as I've talked about. And so I got a friend to give me a deadline, which is today. And uh, the other one was, I realized I was feeling frozen about it because I was so worried that I was wasting time on it by choosing the wrong story idea that I wanted to do. Meaning I'm trying to outline a pilot and it's from a book. So I really have to make some big choices about what goes in this pilot and what goes later and how do you do it visually on, on screen versus internally in the book. And I have to make some big choices. And I got so frozen about making the choice because what if it's wrong? And I'm wasting all my time doing this and it's wrong. And then I was like, <laughs> So I'm not doing it like either way, I'm wasting time. And it just became this very strange loop. And I just realized I, I have to just keep going over what I'm sure is in there and, and just tossing in ideas to see, I just going to have to pick people. I'm going to just have to pick and do an outline. And if it's wrong, quote unquote, and there's no such thing because it's just information. It's so funny taking my own advice is what I guess I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. I just have to uh, not worry about it being wrong. And do and know that I have five more drafts of this to to like Rubik's cube it right like keep turning it and turning it and turning it until I feel in my gut oh that's right and then give it to people and get notes <laughs> <laughs> and do it all over again and again, all over again. again yeah so that was that was those are the things in my week that I thought might be shareable interesting somehow to you guys yeah. uh, uh so that's our week right yes yes that's the week and um before we get started talking about structure uh we did want to uh, thank everybody for listening to the show and uh for going to apple podcasts and leaving reviews uh we got some wonderful reviews and so just wanted to shout out some people who left us comments um ali james and uh keegan and la scribe who um, took the time to listen and give us five-star reviews and uh, write reviews. And we uh, love that because we love doing this show. And the more positive reviews we get on Apple Podcasts, I think, I'm super yep. tech savvy. I don't okay. know. Okay. Yes, that's Apple right. Podcasts, the uh, more people notice the show, the more traffic we get, and then we can continue to do it. Yeah. So we want to keep doing it. Um, we also have our Facebook page where you can come and talk to us. You can talk to us by our uh, emailing us to the screenwriting uh, life on gmail at gmail.com. Um, we really do read it all. We um, love hearing your questions. We're going to answer as many as we can. Um, and just, it helps us to know working for you. Like what is helping you, we can do more of. And so um, we're enjoying ourselves and want to keep doing it. So keep, uh, keep talking to us, people. Keep talking to us. Um, Let's talk about on. structure. Let's talk about structure. Um, again, there's a lot of different um, ways to think about structure. There's no right or wrong. It's kind of whatever works for you. Um, 
I'm we're going over how Lori and I uh, use structure in our writing as a as a base for you guys to when we throw out that word to have a sense of what we mean for more advanced writers. This will be stuff that you quote unquote know, but honestly, even I in preparing for this was like, oh, right. <laughs> I should think about that. It's stuff that you have to constantly come back to over and over and over there. It's a, they're very deep um, wells. Uh, so I hope that this is helpful for you guys. Um, you know, for myself, and I think I can speak for Lorian, character is structure and structure is character. To me, structure isn't something that's outside of the character that you're laying on top of them. Structure is coming from the center of the character and their evolution. And the structure is literally just checking in where the character is in that evolution, the points of the character, so that you as a writer can have touch points um, of tracking that character. Um, so it's still first coming from theme, what we talked about, because what is theme? Theme is the emotional character transformative, uh, you know, arc or, or whatever word you want to use. Their transformation is the theme, the thing that they're learning. They're going, remember, from unconscious to conscious about something very personal and emotional. That movement is structure too, right? Because they're going to start in act one, one place, and they're going to end in act three in a different place. And act two is how they got there. Act two is the evolution. So as we talk through these structure points, we're talking about character. Every word should go back to how the character sees it. So for example, if you follow Hero's journey and you like the word normal world, there's many different words for these things. Let's just use the word normal world. Where are we starting? How are we meeting your character? So in structure terms, I want to know what is the tone? You have to know the tone is being established in act one. We could do five shows on tone. Tone for me means how does it feel? So think about comedy, right? There are so many tones of comedy. Adam Sandler movie is different in tone than a Coen Brothers comedy, right? There's some tone, right? It's not plot. So the tone is established in act one. We can talk about that more. Just ask us if you need some more information about tone. Um, you're going to set up the world, right? So you people probably throw a world around all the time, especially in animation. But in every world, you're setting up a world. To me, it's from how does the character view their world? That is what's important. That is what's essential. How does your main character see the world and taking the taking the audience into the world as the character experiences it, how what they believe the rules of that world are and what, how they believe themselves and who they are in that world. What, can, what, what change can they affect in that world? How does that world act upon them and how do they act in that world, right? So you're establishing also in act one um, what their belief systems are, which again is what I'm talking about. How do they see the world? How are they perceiving it? I want the audience to perceive the world in the same way. Um, um, we've probably heard a lot of want and need, right? That's another thing you're establishing in act one. What do they think they want versus what do they need? What they need is the emotional, transformative, somatic stuff we talked about. What they want is how they might be trying to avoid that because they don't want to go into consciousness about it. They don't really want to change. So the want actually, they, they don't understand it is taking them further from that. If you think about inside out, she wants to control it. She wants to keep Riley happy, but what does she need? She needs to allow sadness to come in and that's what Riley needs. And Joy needs to open up and allow other people and allow Riley to have a greater emotional impact or experience. Right, but that's not what how she starts. She starts, you attach the audience to the characters want. Um, you can think about what are the characters' strengths. Actors especially love this. Think about what are the characters, what are they good at? Do they have a skill? Right. Oh boy, actors love this. Um, they love the free character to have a really strong skill. Um, what are their weaknesses? What some people might say flaw. Um, Jody always uh, taught me that flaw is really just something that the character has a great energy towards or a great, they're almost a positive that they're using kind of in a negative way in order to avoid something like that's what your flaws and something you cut out, right? It's something that, that this character needs to recognize and 
assimilate back into themselves. That's just how I think about flaw. It's usually coming from fear or shame. You can think about their mask. You can think about how are they performing to everybody else in the world, but we in the audience get to see behind them, behind that mask to their vulnerability, right? That's so, so important. What is their vulnerability? What makes them feel vulnerable? Um, somebody so wants that. Go, sorry, go ahead, Lauren, jump in. Oh, so lately, and I don't know why, I've been thinking a lot about the movie Groundhog Day, right? <laughs> and um, all this stuff that you're talking about, like we love him at the beginning of the movie, right? Because he's so funny and he's kind right. of, and he's mean with his funny. We, But we're in his point of view, right? That's his world, right? right. And so it's, but we like him even though that's sort of his flaw or weakness, right? That's sort of right. keeping people at a distance with his mean humor. You enjoy it. You enjoy yeah. the flaw. And in a weird way, it feels like a strength, right? It, he's got control of his life. He, he gets exactly what he wants. That flaw feels like a strength. He has to realize it's a flaw as we realize it's a flaw, right? right. Um, and, I, and, I, and I also, somebody once said to me, what's your character's longing? I thought, oh, that's such a great word, right? What are they longing for deep in their heart? And um, Andrew Stanton once said to me, you know, people who love characters that are trying, right? They're trying. That's who we're, we're starting. We connect to the effort to that try. Um, so th that's all that where we're starting, right? That's normal world in structure, all of that stuff. And then the inciting incident comes usually about page 10, because this is minute marks. Pages are minute marks, right? So about 10 minutes in. The inciting incident arise. Well, what is that? It's a disruption in that world that you've now established into that belief system that you've established, into that character that you've established, right? And it's probably triggering all of their survival strategies, or it's triggering that longing, right? Um, in the hero's journey, they call it the call. That's fine. Whatever you want to call it, it is something that's coming in and offering the character the opportunity to raise their consciousness, right? Now, listen, what can also ask come into your life and ask you to raise your consciousness is a tormentor right it might be that tormentor walking in it might start be starting that's the antagonist who's walking in with the inciting incident but think of it as a call to action to raise their consciousness they don't know that but that's really what's happening right and it could be exactly what they want or they could be reluctant about it you, you know that's really about your character and then we go into the end of act one where they you know so now we're about 20 minutes in, used to be 30, now it's 20, 25. Um, you know, now, you know, for me, act one is so important because it is about setting the goal. And I know that's a word people throw around a lot. Well, why is that important? Because it means the character wants something that you've helped me and the audience want too. That's so important. I can't tell you how many young writers don't get this. I have to watch what the character wants. Otherwise, I'm not with them emotionally. I'm just waiting for them to figure out that they have a dumb want, right? I want what they want. I have to want it as an audience member or a reader of your script deep in my bones. Like you've made it so like, I want it to go get the bank money, right? Whatever it is, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and so that want, it also creates a drive for the main character to be active. Think about that, you guys. If it's not a clear plot goal, they can just start reacting to everything you're throwing at them in act two, right? But structurally by page 25-ish, you've set an active main character. I want that, right? Um, they, so you've set the want, you've probably hopefully also set the conflict to it. It's not gonna be easy, right? If it's a road trip, it's because it's 3000 miles away, you got three days to get there and you've got this jerk with you that you got to drag around and you got no car like all the problems and all the challenges or the actual antagonist, if it's an actual person, that's set the conflict to the goal because the goal and the conflict create the narrative question. It creates a question in the audience. How are they, how is he gonna do, how is she gonna do that, right? I have to have a question at this end of this act, right? That is that I'm deeply invested in that question, right? The other thing I really recommend that you have just as a writing experiment, structurally, at the end of act one, is your main relationship set? Do I know who the main character is going to experience act two with? Now, if it's an ensemble, obviously it's gonna be a lot of people, but even in that, you know, the scarecrow really is, right? Kind of a main, yeah. down inside of that ensemble. There's still always a main, who are they transformed? Who is helping them along in act two in their transformation? It might be the antagonist, 
It might be a supporting character, but know who that main relationship is by the end of act one. And the other thing I'd say about the end of act one is that there's a plan. There's a plan to how they're gonna get the goal, i.e. the yellow brick road. It's not like Glinda arrives and goes, go to the wizard, bye and leave. <laughs> because we don't, you'd have to have like scenes of like, well, how do I get there? I don't know, they'd be wandering around, right? She goes, follow the yellow brick road. Why? Because the yellow brick road is act two. So when people pitch me their movie ideas, what I'm listening for, other, the first thing I'm listening for is why is it emotional? Why do you care about it? Who's the main character and what's their transformation? And what do they want? And what's act two? What is the yellow brick road? So many people pitch me the first act and I, I'm like, I don't know what the movie is. I don't, because there's no, what's the yellow brick road? What, what are we seeing in act two, right? So that's the movie. The, the movie is the plan of how they're going to get the gold. I'm going to get a bunch of people together to rob the bank and I'm going to lead it and, and we're going to do it by this is how we're going to rob the bank. Okay, I, I got it. Now let's move on and let's watch that happen or probably not happen because it's a bad idea and right. it's all, the plan can go awry. It's just the spine that we can, can lay on, uh, can, can hang on to as we're, because it's really, again, it's about structure. It's about keeping your character active. It's about keeping that evolution moving inside of them and externally. You're constantly pushing them to transform, to behave into a choice, right? So this part of, let's say, the end of Act 1, now we're at Act 2, to the midpoint. Um, I really like the Save the Cat guy's idea that he called it fun and games. I think that's super great way of thinking of it. It doesn't have to be fun and games, but it's a great way for my brain, meaning even it's not a tone thing. It's they're now moving through from act one to the midpoint being challenged on that goal and they're starting to evolve, but it feels, maybe it's hard, but it's still oddly fun, right? It's still like possible, right? Their consciousness is starting to move. That relationship is starting to open them up, right? With the antagonist, the conflict is starting to change them, right? Um, and I, and that's a really, sometimes there's a point of page 45, like the mid, the mid of 2B, like, so to, when people say 2B, what they mean is from the end of act one to the midpoint is, I'm sorry, is 2A of act two, right? And right. then 2B is midpoint right. to the end of act, does that make sense what I'm saying? With, so if people throw that out at you, 2A and 2B, that's what they're talking about. So I think it's important too, to talk about uh, what we mean when we say an active main character. Right. And the difference between an active and reactive. Yes, right. choices are being made, but who is driving it, right? And how are they pushing the story forward? Right. Um, and because uh, I think just your character doing something isn't enough, right? It's about that goal. It's about how they are dealing with the conflict. But and but mostly I see um, when I get scripts to read, it's people, it's characters reacting to things yes. coming at them. And so, yes, the story is being pushed, but by other forces, not- Right, them. and that just gives a very flat uh, story because what I'm tuning in for is to see that main character change the plot. The only, re the only way your plot should change is because the character made a choice and did something. And therefore the plot changes. And now it could be the antagonist responding or the story responds with it's okay, now, forcing your character back into another choice. Okay, well, given that choice, I'm taking the left road. Well, the left road means this story, right? I mean, think about those kids' books, right? Choose your choose your adventure. Well, that's a main character literally choosing. It's constant. And that's how we get to know who they are, right? We get to know who they are because of how they're shaping the plot. Nobody else would have this plot. Only this character, given who they are against these challenges, would therefore have this experience and this plot. And, you know, I, I meet, I talk to a lot of people who they say, well, they don't, this main character doesn't want to change. And so they don't want to do anything. And I just have to say, go watch the movie blue, which is the most active main character trying not to do anything. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't wash with me. The masters can do it. And what you're talking about, it takes a master's skill to, sh to show a character who is adamantly inactive, but is active because what are they choosing? inactivity they are choosing over and over and over so if you want a character who is adamantly inactive your job is to beat them up by forcing them 
to choose an activity over and over and over until they you are chipping away at it. Watch the movie Blue, then talk to me about that. Um, so this is, I, it's a really important point and structure helps you know if your character is active because you have to know where they are in the structure points emotionally, How where is that evolution happening? So, so do you think, Lauren, we should stop here at midpoint and do that as a section to yes. in our next podcast yes. so that we can get to some questions? We'll do part two of we'll structure. We'll do part two of structure. Yeah. Um, I think we have uh, time for a question. Yes. Do we have time for a question? question? I think so. Mm -hmm. um, so we got a question from Anita. Um, and thank you, Meg, for talking us through structure. Oh, I always, I always feel like I am reminded of things. I'm working on a, a, a screenplay right now, and I'm in Act Two, and I'm like, oh right, oh right. Like I, I get reminded, <laughs> no, reminded like, oh right, oh right. So, um, so Anita asks. Um, uh, first, she says she's a little embarrassed to ask this question because it's so basic, and I just want to say, um, please don't be embarrassed to ask us or anyone else questions because we're all sort of evolving and learning through this as well. Like I just admitted that I'm learning things on this podcast. So yeah, there's I'm, no basic questions. We yeah. all, we all have, there's no such um, thing. So uh, she said uh, last week, Meg talked about chunking out an outline. Um, can you go over what chunking is? Well, that's just me and my word. But what I mean by that is, um, I don't like I'm using it for this passion project and trying to take this book and make it into a pilot. Um, and I just have so many pieces that I'm literally just in my document chunking out to me is I write whatever comes next in my head. So I'm writing and the character takes over and we go to the right and all of a sudden in my head, I'm like, I have no idea why I'm here. And I write down all the questions I have about it. I write down all of the crazy ideas. Like literally I was writing, I was like, well, what if, what if he's a ghost? I literally wrote that. I literally was like, what if he's a ghost? What would a ghost mean? Would that be a problem? Would that work? And then I write that and then I go, okay, back to where I was, forget that for a second. And I chunk out just all my ideas. Does that make sense? I'm chunking out the big ideas. Think about it, I'm like churning up clay for me to go back and later with a you know, clear mindset going, mm, no, I'm not gonna do the ghost. Uh, or I'm, I'm gonna go this way. And, oh, this is a really good question. Here's the question that I ask that I need. So chunking out for me is just when I'm in a process of needing to figure out what I have, what, what is this? And it doesn't have to be from a source material. It could just be, what do I have in my head? Like, I have this character, I have this kind of world. There's a thousand questions I have about the world. Write them down. It's just getting it out of my head and the, 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 the kind of like buzzing of my head onto a piece of paper helps me see it, helps me feel like it's real. Like I can now work with this. I, I know I can start working with this. And what I'll do next is I've been, I've chunked out the whole pilot and now I've got, I've got my whiteboard and I'm going to start using my structure that we talked about as character movement to watch her in the pilot and where do I need her to be. And, and she, it's a very internal book. So it's tricky because I have to keep her active, even though it looks like she's not doing anything. So it's I, how am I going to move her through the pilot and where is how am I going to change her in, in the pilot? But I'm also setting up a TV show. So I'm setting up a lot of other things and a lot of characters. So now I'll go to my structure point using her evolution and her movement to start kind of pinning it down. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then from there, from my whiteboard, or it could be cards, I will literally then do an outline. And that will shift again, potentially. So every time, every step of this process for me, it shifts and shifts and shifts. And then I'll do an outline. And then my next step is I'll probably write a first draft as fast as possible. Like literally, can I do this in four days from the outline? And then I will do the entire process that I just talked about again. And I think right? so, yeah, uh, one, of the, one of the pieces that I hear and working from working with you is you're not editing as you go. No. You're, the chunking is I write, you know, I try to do this. It's hard not to edit as I go, right? So I write, I write something down and then I have a bunch of questions and then I really wanna answer those questions instead of moving to the next part, right? But then it's about moving to the next part and sort of not erasing 
not discounting, not throwing stuff away until you finish that. That it's part so of it. important, Lauren. What you're saying is so important because here's if you don't you don't know the beginning until you know the end. The beginning and the end are mirrors of your character has got poles. They start here and they end here and they mirror each other. So you can't know what the answer to your questions are you before you know what the end is. Right. You have to see it as a whole thing. When we were at Pixar, do you remember Andrew Stanton would say 30,000 feet, everybody up 30,000 feet because you get so down into the weeds of your questions and answering and editing, you don't see it anymore. And you've got to get up 30,000 feet. And I'm it's so hard. It's so hard, but you, but it's fun too. Like, here's yeah. the thing. Okay, you have a question. It, tell the critic, go take a seat. They're, we're not answering questions. We're not judging it. We're, you can't just sit, tell him, not tell her, whoever that critic is in your head. It's not time yet. I don't know. We got to dig up more clay. We got to get to the end. And then you can bring that analysis in. Then you can bring in all that, all the soldiers to go, eh, no, I don't like that. No, no, no. Right now, you just got to get it up so that you know, because here's the wonderful thing that can happen when you get in that river of creativity and you're just chunking it out and pulling it up and asking questions, you get to the end and you go, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Or, oh my God, that can't be the end. Like I, that's my middle. Right. So I got to get rid of half of the stuff I thought was in here. Right. You, if you spend time editing and doing all that stuff in the first act, that might not even be your first act. That might be the, pre, that might be the stuff that's her past. Like there's no way to know until you get to the end and you go over and over. Okay, that's my process. I'm, there's no right or wrong. Everybody right. do your process. But that's just when I say chunking out what I mean. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're, I think that's it. I think we're out of time. All right, good. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming again. Uh, we're going to talk next week about structure. We'll go from the midpoint to the end and then I'll do a recap to show you the big sweep of it. And um, then we can use that as our base as we go forward. Yeah. So thank you for listening and keep writing and we'll see you next week. All right, see you guys. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network.